Hello, and welcome to the Specialty Matcha Podcast. Uh, my name is Ryan. This is my co-host, Sungjun. Oh, hello. And we're the co-founders of Sanko Matcha Products. Yeah, we launched this podcast to discuss our learning journey in matcha, share startup stories, and interview experts. And today we are going to have our first ever guest to the podcast. We're uh, thrilled to welcome uh, our friend, Pat Penny. So, uh, Pat is a food scientist by training and works on product development in Seattle. Um, and has also worked on matcha product development. Um, he is the one of the founding members of the Tea Institute at Penn State and also a student of Omoto Senke Chanayu. Actually, my very first lesson of traditional Japanese tea ceremony, uh, Omoto Senke, was with Pat. Pat has traveled to Japan countless times, uh, both professionally and pers personally, uh, visiting tea farms, getting to visit lesser-known Japanese tea ceremony schools, um, and getting to meet grand masters of pottery, uh, including Raku pottery. Um, he's also lived in Japan for two years uh, after graduating Penn State, where he taught English as part of the JET program. Uh, on a more personal note, Pat is a great friend and an early tea mentor of mine where we first met at Penn State over 10 years ago. So welcome, Pat. Hey, thank you welcome, guys for having welcome. me. And uh, wow, thank you for the uh, illustrious intro. I feel like, whew, made me feel so special. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did forget those early day uh, Amoto Senke lessons, Ryan. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, like I can remember, you know, my legs going numb with you together. Uh, but, you know, that's some really early trauma bonding right there. Yeah. I don't know who decided the schedule, but for some reason, those lessons were always like at 9 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday mornings. Um, which made it extra special. Yeah, especially as like a college student, right? Like we we all, you know, went to bed at 8 a.m. on Friday night to really get ready for that 9 a.m. Chana you lesson. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that was exactly. just the absolute worst setup ever. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I guess I missed some fun uh, good old days. <laughs> you you missed some serious suffering, but, you know, we, we, we had nice bowls of matcha. We learned. Um, Ryan, I, I don't know how much better have you gotten at Chanoyu since then, but I can't say that I've gotten that much better. No, no, definitely uh, very much a novice. Yeah, you know, I've drank many bowls of matcha since, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. But uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I, I think personally, like as a tea person, I've always been interested in the connoisseurship of the product. And even though I really respect, you know, a lot of the the culture surrounding tea ceremony uh, you know, on the Japanese side as well as the Chinese side, it's it's uh, been one of those things that's always been really difficult for me to get into. Every now and then, I get a little bit of a bug, like let me try and get back into Japanese tea ceremony, and uh, I'll stick my toes back in the water for a little while, and I still still have trouble sticking with it, even after all these years. But maybe one day. I I, I feel the same way. I get intermittent uh, bouts of motivation uh, to want to continue my lessons, but. Uh... No, it's a big commitment. But for the listeners, my cats are now uh, trying to join the podcast. Welcome to the party. Um, future guests. They, they are tea experts, I will say that. They, they've sat with me for many tea sessions. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Pat, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your tea journey and sort of origin story about uh, your experiences in tea and in matcha and um, like matcha is a specialty product as well? Hello, Ryan from the future. Um, part of this conversation gets a little technical, so we wanted to define a few terms. Organoleptic means the perceived flavors that are in a product. Uh, RTD stands for ready to drink. Um, so like those plastic bottles with like ready to drink green tea, you can just consume it. You don't have to brew it. Uh, Gongfu or Gongfu Cha is also referenced, uh, which is traditional Chinese tea ceremony. Um, and Amoto Senke, which is one of the primary schools of Japanese tea ceremony. Yeah, most definitely. So I think kind of my first forays into tea uh, were really as a, as a child. So my grandma, uh, you know, lived in Manhattan for all my life. And um, I would go, you know, visit my grandma in Manhattan on the weekends. And, uh, you know, she was a, a very cultured person. She had traveled a lot. Uh, she had been to China multiple times. And uh, so I really got exposed to tea through her. Um, we would go into Chinatown to go, you know, eat at some good dim rup, some restaurants, uh, or explore some shops. And, uh, I remember going to a lot of shops and seeing like the really large tins, uh, of tea with, you know, various writing that I could not read at the time. Um, uh, proud that now I could definitely read it if it's a tea name. I, I feel pretty confident about that, but, um, you know, I'd see those tins of tea, I'd see all the teaware, uh, and I was just fascinated by it. Um, I really don't know what exactly drew me in, but I think I just saw all of it and, um, you know, I got to drink not Gong Fu, but I got to try teas at 
um, you know, some of these kind of medicine and tea specialty shops in Chinatown. And uh, it just got me really interested in it, in the flavor. And so um, I remember being in like sixth and seventh grade and um, buying tea in Chinatown and buying like a pretty crappy ceramic teapot and bringing it home and like just brewing up really probably terrible tea, like just probably throwing boiling water over like low grade jasmine tea and just loving it though, just drinking it to death. Uh, and uh, I probably didn't learn too much about tea after that for a while. I just continued to enjoy it as a beverage. Uh, but then I think like, you know, definitely like you, Ryan and Zong Jun, maybe not so sure about you since you obviously have a very different background. But uh, when I got to Penn State was when I really learned, you know, that next deeper step into what tea could be. So um, always loved it as a beverage, but never really learned more about it until I found, you know, a group of people who were like minded and wanted to learn more. And um, from there, I mean, Ryan, you know, a lot of I think my tea story, but for the uh, audience, uh, you know, I had helped to develop the tea institute at penn state so when i joined uh it was just a chinese tea ceremony club um but then uh i was one of the first members of the tea institute and helped to um turn the institute into what it was so i was one of the first researching members who was doing some research through our food science uh and agricultural college at penn state uh so i had done some research on taiwanese oolongs different roasting parameters and how it affects uh, both polyphenol levels um, but then tying that into some sensory data too. So trying to see if um, the presence of polyphenols has any effect on sense organoleptic liking um, or if it's totally uh, separate from it. So um, did some awesome research there. Um, I got the opportunity to travel to Taiwan, Japan, Korea through the Tea Institute at Penn State, um, you know, meet many of the same tea mentors that you, uh, Ryan and Zong Jun, got to study with. Um, but, you know, it was really my, my gateway into traveling, into learning about other cultures, um, and to learning more about tea. And uh, I had uh, graduated from Penn State. I had the chance, as Ryan mentioned, to live in Japan for two years, where I got to continue, you know, studying tea, but also living in a, in a tea culture and, um, you know, traveling uh, to many different tea pottery sites, which was amazing. Um, and then coming back from Japan, uh, I, I started to work in product development, which is where I got to kind of develop a different appreciation and lens for commodity tea products, um, and learn things that were quite outside the realm of what I had learned in the specialty tea, you know, as, as a hobby, but also as an industry. So I feel like I've had a really good chance, you know, in the last 10 years, cause wow, holy crap, I graduated 10 years ago. Uh, I had a good chance to really just round out my understanding of tea as a product, you know, as a, as something that consumers like, and not just as something that us specialty hobbyists like, but you know, what is tea for the masses? So I feel like I've had a small chance to do it all. And I'm excited to, you know, continue doing it for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. The tea journey never stops. Okay. Um, so based on your experience living and working in Japan, what's your perception of how the average Japanese person views matcha? I feel like in the West, when we talk about matcha, matcha culture, a lot of people think that it exists in Japan in this very rich way, this very traditional way. It touches a lot of Japanese consumers. Um, in my experience working there, I've never lived there, right? I feel like actually a lot of Japanese people don't know a lot about matcha culture, um, especially younger people or people of working age. Um, and when you start asking them about matcha, they're like, yeah, yeah, it's very traditional. I don't really know anything about it. And it's kind of put on this pedestal and you either know something about it or, you know, it's not as approachable even within Japanese culture. Is that like a correct perception or what was your exp lived experience there? Yeah, I, I feel like you kind of hit the nail on the head. So uh, obviously your, your time traveling there led you to some pretty deep insights, I think. But uh, I, I would say, you know, I so I taught while I was living in Japan. So I came into contact with people of all ages. Uh, I was teaching elementary school, junior high school. Uh, the people who I was working with were between my age and uh, probably in their 60s and 70s. So um, I think I had a good chance to talk to lots of different people of different backgrounds. And um, I would always talk about tea because that's what I'm passionate about. And so at some point it would come up. Um, and usually, you know, when I'm doing school lessons or if I'm meeting people for the first time and I'm the token foreigner, um, you give a, you know, self-introduction. And I would always say like, you know, my hobby is tea. And so, you know, polite Japanese conversation. If someone has an awkward, silent moment with me at some point, they'd ask me, you know, how did you get into tea or why do you like tea, this or that? Um, and of course, I, I try and turn it into a conversation. Um, and so I would ask them, you know, do you like tea? What do you know anything about tea? Uh, do you study tea? 
Um, and invariably the answer was like, oh, I, I like, you know, matcha lattes or I enjoy matcha soft serve ice cream. Um, but very rarely did I run into people who actually study tea in any way, shape or form. And I think uh, the parallel I kind of drew was that actually is very similar to the West, right? In the US where, um, you know, I think, Ryan, you might have said this before in a different podcast, but once you know, you know, a little bit about tea, you know, more than 90% or 95% of the population. And that that felt like it held true in Japan. So I don't think the average Japanese consumer really knows how matcha is made, how it's cultivated, what makes it different than any other green tea besides maybe the format. So I, I never really got the inkling that people were particularly interested in it. I think it was just, um, it, it was certainly put on a pedestal as something that was traditional and important because it was traditional and in many ways important because it was Japanese and we were in Japan. Uh, and so there's, there's a level of national pride, uh, you know, to the product. Uh, but, you know, when, when I did meet tea people, um, you know, I think they knew a lot about their own products and they knew a lot about matcha, but the average layman, um, I don't think knows any more about matcha than your average person in America knows about black tea. Uh, that was my perception. So it was really no one's like burning cup of coffee, like equivalent to what we have in the West, like maybe for some people, but, no. uh, no, when um, I would go into school, you know, in the morning, um, everyone would have some kind of uh, like fukamushi sencha or sencha of some sort on their desk. Um, and usually there was a person who was a tea lady, didn't need to be actually a, a lady, uh, but often it was a, a administrative assistant who made tea for everyone in the morning in a giant pot. Um, it was some kind of dirt cheap Shizuoka, you know, real uh, <laughs> value uh, tea. Um, it gave me a headache and so I didn't drink it but um <laughs> I, and which didn't lead to questions of like oh, I thought you liked tea but you know ev everyone did seem to drink tea in the morning um but I think it was very much similar to the way that you know um in the 90s and 2000s everyone drank Folgers coffee in the morning I, I don't think it was a beverage that they think about and certainly matcha isn't what showed up but green tea would show up in the morning and people would drink it but it was just another hot beverage and Maybe it gave them a little energy, but I don't think they thought much beyond that. You know, it's really similar to uh, what the status of Chinese tea in China is uh, as well. You know, like it's it's there's some sort of uh, national pride, some sort of uh, cultural recognition, but it's just so ubiquitous that, uh, you know, it's almost just like you know, water for people uh, on a daily basis. Uh, you drink it for dinner, you drink it for breakfast, you drink it for, you know, any kind of situation that uh, people just do not find such a uh, like like a personal interest into uh, into this kind of things on a daily basis. Yeah, I feel like um, the average consumer beyond a matcha latte maybe comes into matcha only through RTD products or dessert products. Um, I don't feel like even a, a lot of Japanese from what I've seen and experienced at least um, really drink a lot of straight matcha. Like if you're not practicing tea ceremony, you're probably not sitting down to a bowl of usucha, you certainly have probably never experienced koicha, mm. but you know your your experience of matcha is probably like, oh, this is the RTD you know product that I get out of the vending machine or from the Seven Eleven, and that's my experience of matcha. Pat, uh, I have a question actually. Like, do people have some kind of um, uh, association with like some uh, like an age or a cultural identity to someone that consumes matcha in Japan that is Japanese, like for you know other people? Because like in China, like if you say you like drink tea every day and you you do lao ren cha, like the very term of lao ren cha means elders tea. Like there's a very, mm -hmm. yeah, very, very uh, some age label uh, towards uh, that kind of a practice. Yeah, that, that's a, a really good question. I, I wouldn't say that I noticed for, uh, you know, tea enthusiasts, a really specific group of people, whether that be age, gender or any anything of the sort. Um, I do think when you talk about uh, tea and you're living in Japan and you're a foreigner, most people do find some other foreigner to reference that's involved in tea. So like when I was living in Japan, there's a few other Westerners, not usually Americans, but some Europeans um, who were famous for writing some tea books in both English and Japanese. Um, and you can find these books. I'm, I'm not going to promote them on your podcast or talk about them. But, uh, you know, they're bilingual Japanese and English tea books. And so anytime I would mention like, oh, I like tea and someone knew a little bit about tea, a Japanese person, they would often point me to this other foreigner who writes about tea. 
Um, so that that was the only experience I really had of someone associating tea with a specific group of people. They're like, you're white. Here's another white guy who wrote about tea. Uh, let's talk about him. <laughs> so that, that was my experience. <laughs> Maybe you guys can become friends. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, I, it was definitely all uh, all done with the best of intentions, but yeah, it was it was pretty funny. So, uh, Pat, one of the things we've been talking about on the podcast is like, what is matcha? Um, from a consumer perception definition, from a legal definition, from an industry definition. So, how would how would you best answer the question of how do you even classify and define what makes matcha matcha? Such a good question because I I think you know we are. Uh, industry people. And so we have a certain perception of what we think matcha is. But if I were to take a step back and just try and put myself in the feet of the consumers, I think they just think of it as maybe Japanese. I'm not even sure that all consumers think of it as Japanese, but um, green tea that's in powder form. I don't think that the average consumer knows anything about shaded cultivation. I don't think they know anything about deveining. I don't think they know anything about uh, the milling process or what kind of mill, right? Like an Ishiyusu or whatever is used. And in fact, I think most consumers' perception, at least in the West, is detached from tea ceremony. So they don't even think about, you know, taking a chasen and a, a bowl. Um, they just kind of see it as another product that can end up in a, a milky beverage or a sweet. When I personally think of matcha, my my kind of definition of it and one of the working definitions in the industry, but certainly not the only one, um, is you know a a shade cultivated green tea from Japan um, that is milled by a stone mill, at least for the higher quality product. Um, and often you do see some uh, micron number associated with it when you're in kind of the uh, I think more R and D or quality uh, side of of you know tea. And so often you'll see numbers thrown out like. Uh, you know, below 10 micron. Um, I've certainly had many amazing matcha products that are above 10 micron, but I have seen that number thrown out. I think it's a little arbitrary, um, hmm. but you you will get as fine as that in some people's definition of what matcha can be. I'd be interested in, in what your guys' thoughts are on how, how you define matcha um, as people who are kind of trying to work on what the next evolution of matcha milling could be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a whole can of worms because you have consumer perception, which is very different than industry. And then you have the questionable legal definitions, which there aren't really any. I think there's some rules in Japan um, around what can be labeled and sold as matcha, but uh, it you know it's really a mess of a system um, where you have all of these overlapping that overlap a little bit, but not completely. I think the word matcha um, to most educated consumers' mind should be product that is Japanese, even though a lot of consumers perceive any powdered green tea, you know, they would call matcha. I don't know if we call Chinese origin matcha mocha, which is the Chinese word for it. Um, I think that I don't know if that would be more or less confusing to consumers and would help or hinder the category as a whole, right? Because maybe matcha could be a more umbrella term like wine, which can be grown anywhere, um, or it should be yeah. more regional specific yeah i don't know yeah. it's hard to say it, it is super confusing yeah it, it is because uh like you were saying you know you have mocha right for chinese ground tea of any sort um you know from korea korea does have a a tea practice there is a whisking portion to their tea practice although not the predominant form that you'll see and they have malcha right which is the korean equivalent of of matcha um mm. And certainly, I think if you threw those names out there, it would probably be so confusing for Western consumers, like just thinking about Americans, if they saw three similar products in the market with those three different names, and they kind of all start with an M and all end with an A. But I bet you, you'd have so many people who are like, what is the difference between this? Um, I, I, the other day, just saw uh, on a website, I won't, I won't call out who they were, but something labeled as black matcha. And it, it turns out it's hojicha, uh, powdered hojicha. Um, oh. And I just thought to myself, like, you know, I, I could see where that might be an easy step for consumers mentally to go like, oh, I know matcha and I know it's green and this is roasted, but it's kind of like matcha. Uh, but I thought to myself as like a, at least a, a someone who really enjoys tea, right? Like it feels so deceiving, right? Because it is quite a different product. It goes through very different processing. It has a very different end flavor, but the format is the same. And so you have to ask yourself like, is it more helpful to consumers or more harmful to consumers to try and 
uh, tie these kind of products together. So it, it is really interesting when you do have this uh, lack of legal definition, um, what, what it ends up coming onto the market, right? Yeah, but yeah. I think, you know, like by the end of the day, the, the, the very word matcha is a Japanese term. Like it's, a, it's from the Japanese language. I, I think, you know, it, it might not be necessarily beneficial like, uh, you know, to, to kind of bastardize uh, the term into other region or other culture. It's like, like calling pava, like uh, Spanish champagne. <laughs> I don't think that would be, uh, that, that would be uh, overall beneficial uh, to, 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 you know, all the products coming from those regions. I think that's a great parallel to draw. And I, it, it leads me to a question for you too. Have you had, you know, products that were high quality that were produced like a matcha coming from outside of Japan, so Korea or China. Uh, I've had a few opportunities to try some matcha-like products from other countries and just wonder what your guys' thoughts have been on them. Yeah, so we have tasted a few Chinese ones on the lower end and are not that impressed, but we've actually recently ordered a bunch of samples and are trying to get in contact with some producers in China. And it's very interesting because... A lot of the Chinese tencha production, which is the precursor to matcha, they're using identical cultivars. And we, we learned that Yabukita, which is the primary Japanese tea growing cultivar, was legally brought into China in like the 1970s. There's actually a really long history of Yabukita cultivation in mainland China. Um, and they have even some of the higher end Japanese cultivars, ranging from Asahi, Samidori, Okimidori, that are all being taint, uh, shade grown. Uh, processed on similar equipment. They're importing Ishiyusu, Japanese millstones. So the processing and cultivars are very, very similar. All those nature and nurture components, the only thing that's different is the country. Um, And even the climates are not that drastically different for the regions where they're growing this stuff. It's, uh, you know, we've anecdotally heard that it is producing very similar results. And we've also anecdotally heard that there's a lot of uh, exportation of Chinese tencha into Japan to be finished processing and uh, some questionable labor decisions. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of those machines, like you were saying, right, a lot of the processing and all that is the same. A lot of the machines in Chinese factories for matcha type tea production are Japanese machines. Uh, so it, it really is, uh, you know, aside from being in a different location, it is almost the exact same product and process just displaced to another location. But you said you tried some products on the lower end. Did you find anything on the higher end that you enjoyed? Not that we've tasted yet, but uh, we're, we're early in our okay. consumer journey there and our research journey. Okay. I, How about I you? promise you that it's out there. Yes, it's out there. There is some good Chinese matcha. Um, it does take a lot of hunting and it is, uh, I, I would say that the value is there for it. So the price point is, I, you're not going to save an amazing amount of money, uh, but it is a slightly better price point. Uh, mm. But it does take a lot of work to find it. On the Korean side, I've, I've had some really great Korean matcha, but uh, that's another one where the juice might not be worth the squeeze. I think on the Chinese side, it's it's worth it once you find it. Uh, but on the Korean side, it, it's a lot of work to find a product that's of similar caliber to high quality Japanese matcha. And uh, it's much more expensive. So probably not worth it. <laughs> Do you know if they use Japanese cultivars? <laughs> Interesting. In Korea? Yeah. Uh, so I've, of the facilities that I've been to in the factories and plants that I've been to, I have seen both Japanese cultivars that have been legally imported, similar to what you were saying. So like I did see Yabukita, I've seen Goko, I've seen Asahi. Those are the three I can remember for sure off the top of my head that I have seen um, in Korea. I didn't see those in traditional Korean cultivation areas like Hadong, Jirisan area. I saw those mm. in Jeju. Uh, so I'm not okay. sure how prevalent they are uh, outside of Jeju. But in addition to that, there were Korean native uh, cultivars, uh, or sorry, Kore- Korean native varietals, but then also cultivars that were purposely developed to be made into matcha. Uh, but then other fascinating cultivars as well in Korea that are made for like specifically skincare products and things like that. So um, the Korean tea industry is very advanced and very interesting, um, albeit extremely small. Interesting. Interesting. It, it might be cool to see in the future, like in China, people would uh, repurpose some of the uh, Chinese green tea cultivar into, uh, you know, grow, uh, making matcha. 
Yeah, I mean, for sure in in China, I'm sure there's already uh, tea that's being repurposed for lots of other things like, you know, food and uh, beauty products and all that. So I think uh, one day you'll certainly if if the way the industry moves is closer and closer towards single cultivar, which is what it seemed to be doing for the high quality, you know, connoisseur market. um, I would not be surprised if one day, you know, China wants to have a Chinese matcha, right, that speaks to their own terroir, their own cultivars. Um, so I, I think you'll see it one day, or it might be a bit of a revivalist, um, you know, production where they try and find some old varietal that was used for mocha, right, in the Song Dynasty, yeah. and try to recreate that or something. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a lot of marketing around it. Like, yeah, because right now, like, if you are using Japanese uh, cultivar, Japanese equipment, Japanese processing method and growing method, uh, you know, it's it's really matcha. It's not mocha. <laughs> it's matcha growing in China, basically and be made in China. Yeah, just different export tariffs. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> so Pat, you've been into matcha as a consumer for much longer than I have, probably by like three or four years. Um, so going back into the really early 2010s, maybe even earlier, how have you seen that evolve? Like you're, you've been in and out of New York City all that time. Like how have you seen, like we in very recent years, seen the rise of single origin, single cultivar, single estate, matcha, feels like a very new phenomenon. Like, how has that uh, yeah. transformation ha- happened by your perception? Yeah, uh, so I, I think you pretty hit it, hit it pretty accurately. Um, I really only got exposed to matcha uh, through Japanese tea ceremony, and that started at the Tea Institute. Um, so I, I never heard of matcha or had it before 2010, actually. Um, so I only got a little head start on you, Ryan. But I, I will say, you know, over the last 14 years, um, between being in, you know, the northeastern United States, uh, living in Japan, and then kind of coming back, um, it was interesting to see how prevalent matcha was and how much it grew, I think, in the time that I was gone and came back to the US. So I certainly as a tea consumer noticed when I went to cafes, you know, prior to moving to Japan, uh, when I was in the US, like in Pennsylvania, New York, um, I would notice when matcha was on the menu and if there was actually something unique or special going on with the matcha, like if I saw in the front of the store in a lobby for a cafe that they were selling, right, individual tins of a single cultivar matcha, um, that was something that I'd like definitely notice and it was relatively rare. And then, you know, living in Japan and coming back to the US, I felt like in that two year period, it felt like matcha had a certainly had a boom. Um, and I felt like every good cafe I went to, you know, had a source of single origin matcha. Um, It wasn't just kind of one of the large Japanese companies that we're all kind of familiar with, but it was something special or something kind of um, small. Um, And it it looked like a lot of what I saw from cafes was that they were promoting either the small farmer or single cultivar product. I would say what I've noticed in the last couple of years, probably the last five years, is that it just seems more and more ubiquitous. And I don't know that it's specifically the high-end product that I've seen is more ubiquitous, but just matcha as a whole. So I definitely feel like I saw that that third wave moment where you really mm. started to see the high-end matcha products pop up. But then I feel like it almost felt like it got drowned out by just a massive wave of matcha. And everywhere you go now, I don't, I don't care if it's you know a mom and pop shop, a, lo- a large chain, I feel like you can find multiple variations of some kind of matcha beverage. It's the same matcha product, right? But multiple variations of matcha beverages on every cafe menu and in every supermarket. Um, so it's it's just become so much more massively popular. I wouldn't be surprised if in you know the next couple of years, that popularity starts to kind of converge on, once again, high quality matcha. I think the the setting is right. I think the consumer is interested. Um, I think it's just really time for, you know, companies who are interested in promoting single cultivar or higher quality matcha. Um, it's time for them to find their angle, right? And to, to get it out onto the market. Makes sense. And a large, a lot of that's being driven by um, forces at the farm level and the sort of the middleman layer of tencha and matcha uh, of these like blending houses, Right, like it used to be that a lot of this tencha just didn't get finished as single cultivar products, and then just got moved into some blend. But like now, is it just that farmers have more and more power because like these Western markets want single origin, single cultivar products, and they're finishing more and more of their products that way, and it's removing power from those big 
intermediary blending houses, which buy a bunch of tencha from a bunch of farms and use it to create products. Like, how is that trickling down at the farm level? And how is the supply chain adapting to this new demand as you see it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think from at least the experience that I've had, it's really on a farmer to farmer basis. Um, I think you have some farmers who, you know, find their avenue or access into the Western market. You know, these these are farmers who are very passionate about their product, right? Um, they have something special. And so, you know, they're, they are sought out for this reason. Uh, but I think you, you have farmers who have seen that through, you know, providing their product direct to consumer, um, not only do they foster, you know, greater communication with, you know, who it is that's going to ultimately consume their product, um, but I think they have more control, right, over their product and they can kind of bring into the world the, the product that they want their matcha to be, right, that they want their tencha to become. Whereas, you know, I, I think the, the large blending houses and the large finishing houses, they have a purpose and they still exist and they're still putting out a ton of product. Um, you know, there's always going to be a market for them, whether it's RTD product or whether it's like culinary grade product. But I think just the the internet, right, and access, direct access to consumers has really just opened up a whole new world for specialty matcha. And I think we're just seeing year over year, more and more people putting their hat into the ring, more farmers seeing as a viable option. And, and it's great because in Japan, I think over the last about 10 years, particularly for tea farming, um, a lot of farmers have not really known what their succession plan is going to be. Um, so a mm. lot of them, you know, were producing Tencha, selling to um, some kind of intermediary, whether it was a holding company or directly to um, a blending house. Uh, and they thought they were going to just kind of keep doing that. And one day, whether they have an heir or they don't, no one was probably going to take over their farm. Um, and, you know, they, they were, from what I understand, farmers, you know, they, it's a it's a difficult living. Um, they're not making tons of money as Tencha farmers, uh, but through having direct access to consumers, the the f not farming industry, but being a, a producer of Tencha or Matcha uh, is a little more attractive to younger farmers um, because they see this route of e-commerce. Uh, and I think that that has started to revive the industry a little bit um, because they can see like younger um, producers can see an avenue for them um, to kind of develop their life and develop their product beyond what their successors have done. Yeah, that makes sense. It's really interesting. You're starting to see all these Tencha farmers, uh, even on Instagram. I um, was doing a bunch of research a year ago, and um, one of the major farmers, Suji-san, uh, I, I believe is the most awarded uh, tea producer in Japan. Um, I took a screenshot of his account yep. when I um, was really first researching this stuff. And I think he had 5,000 followers last year. Uh, and I checked yesterday, he's 10,000. Right? So like what happens when yeah, you have... doubled. Yeah, doubled. Like you have this whole ecosystem of these rock star um, Tencha producers that have direct access to these consumers. Like what does that mean for matcha brands? What does that mean for these large middleman companies? It, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah. And I mean, his products are pretty readily available uh, through the West, you know, via vendors like Oika and some others. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing how the internet, right, can kind of democratize people who are at the top of their game. You know, you can become a rock star in whatever industry you're in, as long as you have a good Instagram. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. You know, you kind of see a uh, vertical integration of uh, producers and uh, manufacturers and also farmers. Uh, in some of the other industry that uh, have went through similar kind of a specialty movement wave, like uh, for example in China, like uh, for the wine industry and the um, the coffee industry, you start seeing a lot of young people, uh, you know, not only just trying to build a new brand, but also really trying to uh, cultivate their own farm, like uh, really understand how their product is being made uh, from end to end. And uh, that actually brought a lot of uh, new generation into like what used to be very tedious job that no one wants to do, like harvesting uh, coffee cherries or harvesting grapes, growing grapes. Um, that's uh, all very interesting. Yeah. Now, if only TikTok was, or sorry, Instagram was half as good as TikTok as an e-commerce program or platform, these these Japanese farmers would be totally set. Yeah. Um, What's that song? Uh, like radio killed or movies yes, killed the video, radio video star. Video killed the radio star. Yeah. Video, video killed, killed the radio, the radio star. star. Yeah. 
feel like that rings true here. Um, so Pat, you you have a food science background. You know a ton about uh, you know food freshness, chemistry, biology, all of these different food processes. You know, one of the things that we're working on is the ability to mill matcha fresh. How would you put that in importance to milling coffee fresh? Like, is it as important? Do you think it's not as important? Because, you know, you see coffee being milk, fresh ground everywhere. Like, even if you go to a random, like, cafeteria in a hospital, they'll have a coffee grinder that's, you know, grinding coffee fresh. And it just doesn't, it seems like an infrastructure problem in matcha. But from a food science perspective, how, how important do you see that problem? Yeah, I, I think it's super critical. So anything you can do to bring that last processing step, you know, like, so grinding in coffee, but milling in matcha, anything you can do to bring that closer to the actual phase when you incorporate the product, whisking or brewing, that that's going to make the product, you know, fresher and the organoleptic experience better. Um, you know, matcha is such a delicate product, extremely delicate. Um, you're talking about something that is so fine, right? In micron, um, you know, for most, most matcha powder, you've got some kind of particle size distribution between, you know, let's say three to four micron up to about 20, 25 micron, depending on the product, you, you are going to have that particle oxidize so quickly, um, you know, once it's been milled. Uh, so anything you can do to reduce the amount of time that it's sitting in a milled state before it's being prepared and consumed um, is going to make sure that you get the the best tasting, the most aromatic, and the freshest feeling uh, flavor experience. Um, you know, matcha not not just through oxidation, but you know through temperature uh, and and many other factors is going to degrade into a product that I think we're we're all pretty familiar with. Like we've all had like old matcha, <laughs> um, and I think you know the anything you can do that's going to reduce its exposure to high temperatures, reduce its exposure to moisture, reduce its exposure to oxygen. Um, is going to give you a, as a consumer a better experience, um, and I think it you know it has nothing to do with like tea ceremony. It's just as a person who enjoys good tasting products, the fresher your matcha is milled, the more you are going to enjoy the taste of that product. I think thinking about some of the ceremonial aspects, and I'm not talking about chana, you like tea ceremony, but thinking about like when you're at home and you take your coffee and you grind it, right? That kind of sets you in the mood to uh, enjoy your coffee. And so for me, like I'll I'll grind my coffee at home. I do a pour over. Um, there's all a little bit of ritual to it. I think, you know, whisking matcha already is so much of a ritual um, to have the ability to, you know, grind it, right, or mill it at home, which, you know, I know isn't exactly what you guys are doing. You're looking more, I think, at, at cafes, but to be able to incorporate the milling as part of the ritual of preparing your matcha um, beyond just the organoleptic experience, I think would also just help you ex get into the zone, right, to enjoy the product a little bit more. So, I know that's a long way, winded way of answering it, but I mean, freshness is is paramount. That's for sure. I was really interested recently because matcha does have such high surface area to volume ratio to do a calculation in a 30 gram can, sort of a standard gram can of matcha, um, how much surface area is in it, assuming that the particles are spherical, which is not true, and assuming they have a, a 10 micron diameter, which is a little generous. It's a little large. In reality, I think it's probably smaller on average. Um, for the really high end stuff. Um, if my calculation is correct, it's approximately 200 square meters of surface area. So like about 2000 square feet. It's, um, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah, it's insane is what it is. But it it's definitely true. I mean, you think about it after the product has been milled at whatever location, you know, somewhere probably in Japan, you know, it's it's nitrogen flushed. But uh, the minute you open it, um, I mean, the amount of oxygen exposure, even if you're storing it in the refrigerator, you know, even if you are trying to do everything you can do to pull out air, um, those particles, I mean, once it's been exposed, uh, I, I mean, we've all experienced it. You, you've definitely got less than a few days before that product changes. And often I think the highest quality matcha um, tastes totally different the day after you opened it and the next day. I mean, it's like having a different product every day. Um, but the unfortunate thing is it's, it's not in a good way, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, it it really goes downhill so fast. Absolutely. Um, so to conclude, um, do you have any questions for us? Yeah. When can I get my hand on one of these matcha mills? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> it's a, a very complex and difficult uh, problem to solve. That you, you need to reduce um, 
first reduce the size of uh, traditional uh, Ishiusu uh, into a countertop machine, uh, which uh, eventually you're reducing the um, grind phase, like uh, how large the millstone is. And uh, by reducing the size of that, you're no, like, you no longer can utilize gravity as your source of uh, pressure. So uh, there are a lot of things that we need to uh, tweak to be able to mimic that kind of a pressure in a smaller surface. Uh, and not to mention about, you know, grinding in such a small surface can generate a significant amount of temperature, uh, which cannot be uh, naturally deposited um, like a traditional stone mill. Um, so temperature grinding in a smaller machine uh, and you still want to maintain a higher output and to reach uh, you know similar level of granularity. Um, there's a lot of problem we need to solve right there, but we are working on it. <laughs> any any exploration into interesting territories? You guys doing any uh, wet milling or introduction of like any uh, liquid nitrogen or anything funky? Uh, some of those areas uh, we, we think have a lot of potential. Actually, both of those would be very interesting is like grinding in an oxygen free mint or seeing if wet milling as a viable method. So uh, we're early on in the concept phase of thinking through what that could look like. But, uh, you know, keeping this system tamed free of oxygen might be a V2 or V3, or maybe a more industrial version uh, of this mill that's, you know, not meant to, to be lower price point. Because right now we're shooting for about the price of like a very nice coffee grinder at a cafe. So definitely pretty far yeah. above what most consumers would probably pay, but still like totally within the realm of what a specialty coffee shop could afford. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm excited to see it hit the market. Um, you know, if there's ever a unit that makes its way to the Pacific Northwest, let me know and I'll be one of the first customers at that store to try out the freshly milled matcha. Uh, I, I am interested if you guys are going to continue to explore once you kind of find a viable specialty cafe option um, going smaller and smaller. Would you ever want to get to the level where a home enthusiast would be able to, uh, you know, purchase it and get a similar quality? as to what you could get at the maybe cafe scale. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Easy enough. Sounds like uh, you guys are working on it. So it, that, that'll that come right after the cafe scale one, right? Just a couple weeks later? Uh, a couple weeks later. Product development happens that fast. Yeah. Time. Perfect. We'll, we'll get our people on it. Right, Sam? <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Yep. <laughs> I, I did want to ask you guys one last question. So uh, I'm sure as you've been, you know, working on this, uh, just thinking about, you know, uh, when I'm working on like something specific for tea uh, or when, you know, I'm traveling in a specific area of China or Taiwan for tea, uh, you know, you start to get obsessed with this one specific product and it really snowballs. So I'm interested, you know, Ryan and Zongjun, both of you, as you've started to work on Sanko Matcha products, um, how have your tea drinking habits changed um, and particularly, you know, your, your matcha consumption? How has that changed? Drastically increased. <laughs> you know, you got to try it out out of the uh, different cultivars in different regions, which uh, it's quite an education journey. But uh, on a daily basis, uh, I'm still pretty much a uh, matcha latte uh, drinker. I recently uh, found uh, sparkling water with matcha being very tasty. Uh, drinking straight matcha still is a little bit uh, too sharp to my stomach, especially in the morning. Um, but Ryan seemed to be uh, more of a straight matcha drinker uh, than I do. Yeah. No, for me, I, I'm definitely more purist on the team and, and just like enjoy straight matcha. I've been experimenting a lot more with brewing parameters and how different dilution ratios affect whisking, uh, the way they affect foam formation. Uh, how different temperatures express different flavors. It's wild, actually. If you compare matcha to coffee and the flavors that you can bring out in coffee by different brew methods or ratios or over versus under extraction, there's like all these parameters you can play with. In matcha, the flavor variance is pretty similar. The universe of possibilities for flavors, even within one can of matcha, um, is larger than I realized um, until I started systematically testing it. I mean, that's just applying your uh, your Gong Fu background, I think, you know, onto matcha as a product. There's there's certainly a world of possibilities. Um, you know, Ryan, I think it's not surprising that you have jumped off into the deep end on matcha because I think even in the early days of the uh, Tea Institute, when you were, you know, first joining and studying Chinese tea ceremony, I feel like you were always really into matcha. Like anytime we had fresh matcha around, without a doubt, I would walk in to the tea house, 
and you would just be guzzling down like a fresh bowl of matcha. So um, in some ways, none of this is surprising to me. It's kind of like you've just come full circle on your tea journey. (laughs) Very true. Should we wrap up? Let's go. All right. So thanks for listening. I think that's all we have time for today. So if you like this episode, please give us five stars or consider sharing this with a friend. Um, And thank you so much, Pat, for joining. Uh, It was great having you on. And uh, be on the lookout for new content. Recording stopped.